Srimad Bhagavad Gita, Chapter 8, Text 2, Translation and Commentary by His Divine Grace A.C. Bhaktivedanta So you can read that out, Chapter 8, Text 2. Is there any other table that you can put the book on? I read the verse in Sanskrit. Adi yajya satam ko tra dehe spin madhusu dana prayara kale chakatam geo si niyata adhi. Who is the Lord of sacrifice? Maybe I should be verse 1. I just opened it on that page. I read verse 1 instead. The first page I opened it was all the parts and then I. Right, chapter 8, text 1. Arjuna Uvacha, King Tanakamma, King Adhyatma, King Karma Purushottama, Adhi Purutamja, King Gautama, Adhi Dayam Kimuchita. Arjuna inquired, O oh my Lord, O oh Supreme Person, what is Brahman? What is the Self? What are furtive activities? What is this material manifestation? And what are the demigods? Please explain this to me. I guess I'll read a couple of them in English because we have quite a few devotees who don't understand. We have some who don't understand English or Tamil. Arjuna inquired, O oh my Lord, O oh Supreme Person, what is Brahman? What is the Self? What are creative activities? What is there? Material manifestation, what is this material manifestation and what are the demigods? Please explain this to me. Report. In this chapter, Lord Krishna answers different questions from Arjuna, beginning with what is Brahman. The Lord also explains karma, fruit of activities, devotional service, and yoga principles, and devotional service in its pure form. The Srimad Bhagavatam explains that the Supreme Absolute Truth is known as Brahman, Paramatma, and Bhagavan. In addition, the living entity, the individual soul, is called is also called Brahma. Arjuna also inquires about Atma, which refers to body, soul, and mind. According to the Vedic dictionary, Atma refers to the mind, soul, body, and the senses also. Arjuna has addressed the Supreme Lord as Purushota, Supreme Person, which means that he was putting these questions not simply to a friend, but to the Supreme Person, knowing him to be the Supreme Authority, able to give definitive answers. So we may wonder, what's this got to do with me? What is the relevance of this to me? I'm sitting here in Salem, Tamil Nadu, and these quite what is Brahman, what is the, what is the self, what are fruit activities, what is the material manifestation, what's got to do with me? I need to eat three times a day and live my life and, you know, what's, what's this question? It has no relevance to me whatsoever. We don't find this kind of thing discussed in the newspapers. Well, we, we might think that, why is Arjuna asking this? What's the relevance to Arjuna? You know, we might think that, you might think that he would ask Krishna that, you know, what, what is the uh, method to overcome the enemies in the battle, you're a great fighter, Krishna, so tell me, and remind me of some of your skills. And that's practical, isn't it? Because you'd rather fight a battle. So often people bring this to us, that, you know, what's, what's that got to do with me? I've got real things to worry about. So this is the, I'm, I'm concerned with the real world. But Arjuna was asking these questions on the battlefield. He had a it was in a pressing situation. I know that means a pressing situation. Yeah. And uh, we go on in the next verse, ultimately the questions come to Prayana Kale Chakatam Yeosi Niyatatma Dihi. That how can, at the time of death, how can the Adi Yagya, the Lord of Sacrifice, how can it be understood? Niyatatma Dihi means those who live ordered, controlled lives. It's not, it's not a subject for understanding for people whose lives and minds are not controlled. In the, in the, not regulated. 
So even though Arjuna was in this situation, a highly pressing situation, um, he was concerned with ultimate reality. Arjuna's question was not simply about whether to fight or not fight. Uh, that was the, the question, to fight or not to fight. But the level on which Arjuna was asking the question was, it was um, on the level of, of what is my ultimate duty. And therefore, Krishna explained them to him. To understand this, it's, uh, we, we have to understand what is our existential position. What is going on in the world and beyond this world and where do I fit in? So it may seem that reality is, the whole of reality is concerned with filling my belly three times a day and that is my family members. That is one level of perception of reality. Anamai, pranamai, that's the low level. The level of uh, I, me and mine. Ahambaniti. So uh, Krishna is explaining and Arjuna is asking, going deeper to understand this properly. Arjuna wasn't the kind of, yeah, yeah, you hear stories of you know, people you know, in the modern age, they get a machine gun and they just go and shoot a bunch of people. And this is the soldiers in the modern war. That there was a, that one Croatian devotee, you remember? His mind was very disturbed. He was telling, his mind was very disturbed because in the war he used to go into villages and with a machine gun and just kick down the door and just shoot everyone there. <coughs> just oh, man, woman, child, dog, everything. Or maybe, he's not sure. Anyway, he died. So Arjun wasn't that kind of kind of very gross fight. He was a very highly principled person. Yeah. He wasn't, you see, to get people to fight, you know, say, come on, man, we gotta, we got to smash those, and, you know, we got to defend the country, and this, this is how you motivate people to fight. You know, what, what is it that makes a, a man will, just like, there are so many examples, that D-Day is very famous in Britain, I mean, how they, there's so many soldiers, the, the British and American soldiers in uh, Normandy, in northern France, they were charging into machine gun fire. Now, how do you motivate people to run towards people shooting you with machine guns? So know. people have the idea, you know, it's glorious for our country. So... Uh, but Arjun, he wasn't on such a base or foolish level. He really wanted to know what's right, and he, he, he was prepared to fight fully, always if he thought it was right. Otherwise, uh, he, 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 he was not at all prepared to fight. So sometimes people may interpret, well, Bhagavad Gita, it's like the forces of good and the forces of evil, like this. But it is. It's a, it's a question of actually what is correct for us to do. But it's not allegorical. It's very, it's very specific. The, uh, in the very first, in the purport to the very first verse, Sri Prabhupada points out that how some foolish people, they say that, what is it, Kurukshetra represents the body and the five Pandavas, they represent the five senses. That's Mahatma Gandhi, actually. That's his foolish interpretation. But it's not allegorical. Yes, it's a discussion of what is right and what is wrong, but Krishna is a person, he is the Supreme Person, and right is to surrender to him, and wrong isn't. That's the point. Arjuna and Krishna are not mythological people. They say that Vyasadeva is also mythological, and who wrote about this? Mahabharata and Puranas. <laughs> so, uh, all these questions are relevant to every person in every time and place and circumstance. Even in the most uh, pressing of circumstances, this, underst this, this understanding has to be retained. 
often we hear people, even sometimes devotees, say that you know, well, that's all right, but you know, you know, we have we have our real life problems to deal with. There's a misunderstanding that philosophy is for idle people or rich people, or, and for for most people, the, the reality is that you just have to work hard. But actually, philosophy is required for every person. We're not, we're not really people, we're not really humans in the full sense, and that's why we ask these questions. Arjuna's question here, King Tad Brahma, what is, the, what is Brahma, what is the ultimate truth? That question qualifies one as a human being. Atato Brahma Jignasa, this human life begins with inquiry into ultimate reality. So without asking these questions, one may be very busy running here and there, but he's not fulfilling the purpose of human life. Without asking these questions and getting the proper replies, one cannot come above the level of the animals. Then working hard and earning money to fill the belly and, and uh, just completely absorbed in material desires without understanding that I'm eternal spirit soul. So this uh, Bhagavad Gita is relevant to every person in every time and every place. And it's just a, another phase of Maya to think that it's not relevant. Now, as Srila Prabhupada has mentioned, this Krishna conscious world is meant for preaching Bhagavad Gita, this knowledge of Bhagavad Gita, as it is all over the world. Right. So what is that? Is that another sectarian religious movement? As some people are pushing the Bible, some people are pushing the Quran, we shall push the Bhagavad Gita and make some rivalry with them. When Srila Prabhupada visited Gainesville in Florida, there was some interview on TV, so the interviewer was trying to press Prabhupada and trying to make him look like some sectarian who was trying to... They're very expert, these people, in asking questions and they, make, they want to make people look bad. I'm saying, well, what's your purpose in coming here? People are already, they're already Christians, they're already this religion, this is being followed by the people of this culture for hundreds and thousands of years. Well, why, why come and preach something else? So Prabhupada explained that it's, it's not a question of being in competition with any religion, but we want to give actual knowledge of who is God, who are we, and what is our relationship. As Srila Prabhupada notes in the uh, introduction to his Bhagavad Gita as it is, that here in this Bhagavad Gita as it is, you'll find all that is in all the different religious books of the world, and more. Because actually, it is, uh, what, not only Bible, Quran, but even in all the, in all the Quranas, you won't find the, the very clearly delineated knowledge of who are we, who is God, what is our relationship, who are the demigods, what is Brahman, it's all there, concentrated in Bhagavad Gita. Even in the Vedas, you see that as well. Trigunya Vishaya Veda. The Vedas are mostly concerned with Karmakana, which is just, a, it's not spiritual knowledge. And then the Vedas, uh, when you. Atato Brahma Jignasa, one inquires into Brahman. This is the first sutra of Vedanta Sutra. So sometimes this is understood to me, or you know, some commentators have said that when one is uh, realizes that the karma kanda section of the Vedas is that we have to go beyond this, then we come to the jnana kanda. So that is called Vedanta, or the the ultimate knowledge of the Vedas. Vedanta means the Upanishads. What we often say Vedanta, we think of Vedanta Sutra, but actually it's Upanishads, and Vedanta Sutra is the uh, explanation of that. But it's mostly uh, in very uh, abstruse language, 
indirect, subtle, and uh, it doesn't clearly delineate the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Yadat Vaitam Ramo Panashadi, the prayer describing or glorification of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu says that the uh, what the what is described in the Upanishads is generally understood as the the impersonal understanding of Brahman. So Bhagavad Gita is uh, serves the same purpose as Vedanta Sutra. It's, it's Gita Upanishad. All of these questions of Arjuna, King Tad Brahma, King Madhyadma, King Karma, Purushottama, what is Brahma, Akita, what is the Adhyadma, I mean this very term, this is Upanishad, it's, it's very uh, highly philosophical language. With karma, it's, what is the understanding of this term? It seems a very simple term, but it's actually so much uh, deep philosophy behind understanding what is karma. So this is uh, all, everything is summarized here in Bhagavad Gita and brings us to, uh, Bhagavad Gita also spoken by Bhagavan, Purushottama, the Supreme Lord, brings us to the conclusion of understanding the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Bhagavad Gita is often misunderstood by impersonals who are uh, accustomed to understanding the message of the Upanishads in an impersonalistic way. So they see the same language and the same concepts in Bhagavad Gita. But they also see discussion of the Supreme Law and Bhakti, which they think, well, that's more like a Puranic discussion. That's the kind of thing that's discussed in the Puranas about Bhakti. That's for less intelligent people. So they think, oh, Bhagavad Gita is wonderful. It has brought together the Upanishadic and Puranic concepts. And then you see, then you do bhakti to the Supreme Lord. And then ultimately you understand everything is all one. Because due to their misfortune, their envious of Krishna, they're fixed in this uh, impersonalistic way of thinking. When they see the Kintan Brahma, what is Adhyatma, what is Adhyangya, Adhibhuta, Adhita, and they think, oh, it's, this is all the same. This is all impersonal. And they're not able, because they're not able to hear as Arjuna heard, they're, they're not able to be taken as Krishna took Arjuna from these concepts lead automatically to understand the Supreme Personality of Godhead and our relationship with Him. They're not able to follow that. So they start off with a preconception that they already know what the conclusion is and therefore they miss the conclusion. They are unable to understand how all this high philosophical discussion, the conclusion is manmana bhavad bhakto madhyati man namaskru, that we should bow down to Krishna. It seems that that's bowing down to Krishna, that's for very simple people. And we have this very high philosophy. <laughs> They are unable to appreciate the, that what is the greatness of bowing down to Krishna. They think that they are understanding this philosophy, you become very great, you become Brahman. They see people bowing down to deities and they think this is a very low level. Asking for some benediction for the deity from the deity, it's on a very low level. You become a higher level then you become more than the deity yourself. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he uh, explained or he gave the key to understanding Bhagavad Gita and all the Shastras. Trinaga Pisa Nietzsche Yatta Rora Nisa Nishana Amanda Amanadeha Kirtaniya Sadhana. The one should uh, have the feeling that I'm lower than grass. One should be more tolerant than a tree. Then one should uh, be ready to offer respects to others, not desire respect for oneself. And in this mood, one can actually chant the holy names of Krishna. One cannot actually chant unless one has this mood. One who is chanting Hare Krishna, thinking, "I'm so great, I'm so wonderful, I'm I'm senior, I'm superior." That chanting is not chanting. 
that is not Krishna Kirtan. That is simply uh, inflating one's false ego and taking one further away from Krishna. So uh, those who are, have not understood or accepted this principle, then uh, just like the Manavadis, they're simply all their spiritual life is simply inflating their false ego. So this uh, key, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is given. Easy to say. <laughs> it's very difficult to have this book because we are practiced to thinking in a different way. But unless we can adopt this, then we we remain outside devotional service. We, we don't really understand anything about it at all. Even we can learn shlokas and discuss philosophy as if we understand it. But real understanding is manifest in those who are becoming this, uh, free from the egotism of thinking, I am very great. And when we see people come to devotional service with so many strange ideas, I've seen many times people, they, they want to get initiated because they'll think, well, then the others will think I'm important. Now, I'm, now I'm not initiated. When I get initiated, then I'll be important. And now I'm initiated. Now I can get Brahmin initiated. Then I'll be more important. <laughs> no idea, no idea what what actual initiation is. And, the other, and even they get initiated, actually they never really initiated at all. Because Diksha means Divyam Jnanam Yatodhyaya, the transmission of divine knowledge. So you say, well, yeah, I, I, I know, I, I, I know so many shlokas. I can explain, I give good class, and people appreciate it and say, oh, you give very nice class. But if one is, by all these activities, if one is simply feeding one's sense of prestige, then it means he never even began bhakti, or what it means to be a disciple. I was hearing Tamal Krishna Maharaj explaining something about the, the, the Buddhist gurus. And of course, they they're, they don't know what they're doing, but how severely they treated their disciples. He was explaining how there was one guru who he told his disciples, now you build this house, build it. So he built it up to three stories, all by himself. He said, now you break it down. Didn't explain anything about spiritual, so-called spiritual knowledge, just build this house, that's all. And then before it was finished, break it all down. No explanation of why. And then build it again. And then break it again. And then again, so many things he put him through. And then after you know a few years of this, he said that I'm just, that I'm just preparing you because it, when, when you really have to enter into spiritual discipline, then you have to be, uh, you have far more difficult things to do than this. So that idea is then that the disciples should be fully surrendered, just do whatever he's told to do, without any egoism or personal plans. We don't ask people to do stupid things like build their house and then break it down again. That's meaningless, but then Buddhism is, the whole philosophy is philosophy of meaninglessness. Niravatavadam, philosophy of meaninglessness. So, but uh, the principle is there that one should be prepared to follow and accept uh, discipline and difficulties in this. But we don't build a house and break it, do something meaningful in the service of Krishna. Of course, as I was saying this morning, that uh, we're following the Pancharatric system, not the Vedic system. When I say we're not following the Vedic system, that, mean, that means. Um, it's not, that we, it's not that it's non-Vedic, but uh, we follow the Pancharatra section of the broader Vedic literature. Because if we see, just like listed in Haidal to be last, what are the qualifications to be a disciple? Uh, well, there wouldn't be any disciples if you had to fulfill all of them. You had to be practically a pure devotee to be a disciple. But the Pancharatra system is that if they're seen as some sincerity, they don't give them a chance. As Srila Prabhupada explained, that um, normally the system is that you get become qualified and then you are given the post. 
first you're trained and then you become a judge. But uh, our system is that we, we give you the post and we train you on the job, you come up to the stand. So it's very important to understand. It's not that you get initiated, oh, no, now, now I'm already there, now I'm already perfect. That means you're recognized as a, as a student. It doesn't mean that you are now your uh, your Bhagavan. One uh, first qualification is like the, the shisha means shisha. They should accept discipline. So Arjuna, he was a, he was qualified to hear Bhagavad Gita because he fulfilled the three conditions. Pranipat, Pariprasna, Seva. He was uh, fully surrendered to Krishna. He was in a mood of submission. Yes, uh, I accept you as an authority. Then asking relevant questions. So many people come and the only thing they ask is for blessings for their child to pass his examination. And then uh, Arjuna, he, he's ready to serve Krishna. It's not just that he's asking questions and, oh, oh I'm all right, that's your opinion. Ah, uh, he's, he wants to serve. He wants to do what is right. He wants to act his, pass his life in a way that is the proper way of doing it. Arjuna was in the mood of seva, thinking, he wasn't just thinking what's good for me, but he was thinking what, what is the best thing I can do for the whole of human society. I don't to fight. Unfortunately, the, uh, the modern idea of getting a guru is just uh, very shallow. There's uh, just a show of making some obeisance. There's either no discussion of philosophy or they just discuss some, uh, or they discuss it in a very superficial way. Without the uh, <coughs> without the desire to understand what is the actual truth. And for Seva, they think that we'll build, we'll, be, we'll build a big ashram for our guru and then everyone will respect him and I'll be a senior disciple and then they'll respect me. I'm a, I'm a member of a big institution and I have a big position. I'm a senior disciple, I'm a committee member. So in this way, people become uh, disciples and uh, What's going on is they're inflating the so-called guru's false ego and then inflating their own false ego and it's absolutely nothing to do with spiritual life whatsoever. Trinagapi Sunita. Sorry, you finished? finish? You finish. Trinagapi Sunita. This is it's just unimaginable for the materialist. And even if we go through the motions of devotional, so we do, we get up in the morning, we go, we chant, and we go, do our service and this and that, but unless we're really cultivating this mood of surrender, humility, then we don't really go anywhere. It's rowing the boat, but we forgot to untie it from the post. So we're rowing, 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 and going on. So these are all very complex and deep topics which Krishna deals with summarily in this chapter. Just he gives. Arjuna asks one-line questions and Krishna gives one-line answers. So actually it's very, very deep topics. But the one question which Krishna doesn't give a one-line answer to, which he dedicates most of the chapter to, is Arjuna's last question in this series of questions in two verses. This is the really important question, how to remember Krishna at the time of death. So that has to be cultivated throughout life. In this chapter, in the purport, Srila Prabhupada again and again and again quotes Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Rama Hare Hare. This is the way to remember, this is the solution. So this, this chanting, the whole spiritual life is perfect, everything is. Everything is taken care of by this chanting. What is the meaning of this chanting? O oh Krishna, O oh energy of Krishna, please engage me in your service. Very simple, but that and the proper adjustment of consciousness to understand what this means. Srila Prabhupada, he, 
he taught what Chaitanya Mahaprabhu taught, just chant Hare Krishna and everything will be perfect. And then, then why so many books? Why was Prabhupada busy writing so many books? If just chant Hare Krishna, then why what's the need of so many books? Because we have to learn how to chant Hare Krishna. Because Bahu Janma Kare Jadi Shavam Kirtan Prabhupada Napai Krishna Pari Prindam. We may be apparently chanting Hare Krishna, but we don't get the effect, even in many lifetimes. We don't get the point of what what it means to pray to Krishna to be. If we don't get the point of what it means to be engaged in Krishna's service, then our chanting will be like the, just like gramophone record. You can make the uh, you can or you you can make this wind up. Do you know, see they used to have this wind up machine and you wind it up and ding 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 some noise. So the machine can make the sound, but the machine doesn't become purified because it's dull. There's no consciousness. So if there's no consciousness of pleasing Krishna, then that chanting will not be recognized by Krishna. Who is cultivating the six aspects of Sharanagati, surrender, that prayer, the person who is cultivating that, the prayer of such a person is heard by Krishna. So that praying hymn, which I may not be had, Bahujan Makari Yogi Shabam Kitan Tabuta Napai Krishna Pradi that wealth of love of Krishna, which may not be had even after many lifetimes of so called chanting, how to get that, that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu explained. Harshi Prabhu Kahe Shuno Shuru Brahmara Ki Bhavi Nama Loyale Prabhu Kuja Chaitanya Mahaprabhu smiling said to Shuru Dhamma Ramananda Rai. Now you just listen, what is the method of chanting that praying becomes, arises? Shunagapi Sadhicha Yara Tarara. This is what he said Tarara Pisa. This way, if we chant Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, then love of Krishna will arise in the heart. So all these books are, are meant to get this point, to understand all of it, this point with a humble servant, all these services one is engaged in, they're meant for cultivating this sincere, humble serving of That will make everything successful. Any question on this? The six types of the Sarnagati, the six types, of, is it uh, at, uh, like grass, we are humble and talented, like the, uh, the Sarnagati, the six types of the Krishna here? So not six types, but there are six aspects of Sharanagati. You don't know what this, these are? Ah, you should learn. Otherwise, how are you going to do it? Isn't it? If we don't know what it is, then how can we even try to do it? So we should know what these are. This is uh, listed, these six are listed in a verse which is included in Sri Hari Bhakti Vilas and quoted in Srila Prabhupada's purport to Bhagavad Gita as it is chapter 18, text 66, which describes that we should surrender to Krishna. Mame Kami Sharanagati. So there are not six types of Sharanagati, there are six aspects and all of them have to be there. Not that you just choose one. There are nine principal processes of devotional service. Shravanam, Kirtanam, Vishnu, Svanam, Padisevanam, Arshanam, Vandanam, Dasyam, Sakyam, Padanivedanam. Now one can perform any one of these processes and achieve perfection. But to achieve perfection in any of them, the uh, this Sharanagati must be there, all six aspects. It's not that just you can take one and forget the others. Sharanagati means the, uh, the path of taking shelter of Krishna or surrendering to Krishna. So those six aspects are anukulyasya sankalpa, to make a firm resolve 
to only do that, say that, think that, which is favorable for the service of Krishna. And practical yasya, varjanam, everything which is detrimental to developing love of Krishna must be given up. Rakshishatiti vishvasa, to trust Krishna, that Krishna is protecting me. And gopturit vevaram tatar, that Krishna is maintaining me. Atmanikshepa means to fully, uh, to fully give ourselves to Krishna. And Karpanya in a, in a mood of uh, full humility, considering myself very low. So let us try to understand what this is. Otherwise, we may be doing the we may be doing the processes of devotional service, but we won't really enter into what that is. Ultimately, that what what we do, it's not a matter of you know, what we do. I I gave five lakhs, so much money I gave, or. I distributed so many books, so I built such a big temple. Ultimately, none of these things matter. What matters is that Krishna is pleased with us. You, you can build a, you know, a, a 5,000 crore temple that might not please Krishna, because for Krishna it's like a drop of sand. It does it. Krishna can make billions and trillions. He's already got you know, all the best temples and palaces. If the mood is not there of, of wanting to please Krishna, then Krishna won't be pleased. There, there are so many examples. Prabhupada, he would just, when he saw a disciple was becoming puffed up, he just he wouldn't recognize them at all, literally. One devotee, Hari Vilas Prabhu, was saying that uh, Prabhupada, he had arrived at the temple and in Paris, and he came a little late, he was organizing something. Harvilas Prabhu. So he was describing, I was thinking, I, you know, I'm, I'm the Tamil president, I'm very important. So he walked right in, and walked right up to the front and sat next to Prabhupada. And Prabhupada didn't look at him. And one devotee was introducing all the devotees to Prabhupada. Oh, this devotee. He's doing this service and Prabhupada is saying, oh, that's well thought to you. Saying something about each devotee, thank you very much. He said, and then he came to Haribar, this is how the last few words I told Prabhupada. Still didn't even look at him or say anything. He just uh -huh. didn't look at him. <laughs> there are so many, so many instances like this that uh, Guru Das Guru mm -hmm. was telling that he was thinking, ah, he's probably had given him some service to do, to go to some place and do something. And, just as he was going, he walked into Prabhupada's room and said, Oh, now I'm leaving Prabhupada. They said, you know, like, yeah, I'm right. Prabhupada he just didn't say anything, didn't look at him, just turned around and went into the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> so Prabhupada was pleased when devotees performed services. He was very pleased when they did that in a surrendered mood. But however big the service they might be doing, if Prabhupada detected that they were doing that to inflate their own false ego. He just wouldn't reciprocate with that at all. Prabhupada was so kind that he didn't assist people in their uh, attempts to go to hell. Because that's ultimately what happens. And we've seen it so many times that, that people in the name of bhakti just cut their own throats. That they, they start to think, I'm big, I'm important, and then they they, they think they're superior to others, and then eventually, just by their offenses, they just their whole devotion is spoiled. So let us try to understand what is Sharanagati, not just in an academic way, but in our in our lives, in every moment of our lives. So you please learn this. No one should get initiated without knowing this. They should all know what are these six points. In the uh, Gorya Mat, at least at the time of Bhakti Siddhanta Sosra Thakur, even if people were not educated, at that time most people were not, you know, they, they weren't educated, but they had to know the, uh, the, the basic points of the philosophy. Amnaya, Praha, Thakur, they may not even know the verse, but they had to know these principles. What, what are the basic points? The, the, Amnaya Kaha that the spiritual knowledge is received 
through the chain of discipline succession, which is based on Shastra knowledge. That's the first one. Of course, he was. There's no difference. So that's the prama is the uh, guru sadhu shastra, and then nine points pramaya. What is what are the points which they are dis- which the <coughs> describes that uh, Hari Lord Krishna is supreme, and he is sarva shaktim. He is. He is replete with all energies. And Rasab him, he is an ocean of rasa. Tadivinam Shams the Jiva. The Jiva is uh, his separated part of Pasa. That is the English translation of that. And the Jiva can be in two states. Pranute Kavalita, he can be in Maya. Or Tadvimukta, it can be free from that also. So, and then, uh, what is that? The, the sun, sadhana is shuddha. The sadhana is shuddha bhakti, the process for developing Krishna consciousness. Is people one should follow this process. And then, by doing that, one develops love of Krishna. Sadhyam Tatpitim. So at least one should understand these basic points. What is Sharanagati? Otherwise, we don't know it. If we don't know where we're going, how are we, how are we going to go there? Speak in the mic so everyone can hear. Speak into the mic. Hare Krishna. How to practice this uh, position? Sometimes. We are uh, thinking that we are fine, we are all, we are practicing this Trinakati religion and then later we are finding that uh, we have more ego than one of us. Said in Tamil also. You don't know Tamil? Therefore we have to hear regularly and accept the discipline of being a humble servant. If we make the endeavor to go down, that let me be a humble servant. Um, and the Vaishnavas from the higher platform will lift us up. If we try to go up and think that I should stand on the Vaishnavas' heads, then Maya will kick us down. We should hear and understand this. Hear again and again and again. 